a band of men and women led by Lilith Valcor, chief spokeswoman for the Party of Nothingness, gathers at the base of the Great Pyramid and laughs at it. They carry nothing Garian signs. Don't clean our lenses, Gruad. Get the crack out of your own. Every time I hear the word progress, my fur bristles. The sun sucks. Freedom defined is freedom denied. The message on this sign is a flat lie. Lilith Velcor addresses the Nothingarians, satirizing all Gruad's beliefs, claiming that the most powerful god is a crazy woman, and she is the goddess of chaos. To the accompaniment of laughter she declares, Gruad says the sun is the eye of the sun god. That's more of his notion that males are superior and reason and order are superior. Actually, the sun is a giant golden apple, which is the plaything of the goddess of chaos, and it's the property of anyone she thinks is fair enough to deserve it. Suddenly, a band of Ephedians attacks followers of Lilith Velcor and kills several of them. Lilith Velcor leads her people in an unprecedented attack on the Ephidians. They storm up the side of the Great Pyramid and throw the Ephidians down to the street, killing them. Amazingly, they succeed in wiping out all the Ephidians. Gruad declares that Lilith Velcor must die. When the opportunity presents itself, his men seize her and take her to a dungeon. There, an enormous wheel has been constructed with four spokes in the shape of a peace sign. Lilith Velcor is crucified with ropes upside down on this device. Several members of the party of science lounge about, watching her die. Gruad enters, goes to the wheel and looks at the dying woman, who says, This is as good a day to die as any. Gruad remonstrates with her, saying that death is a great evil, and she should fear it. She laughs and says, All my life I have despised tradition, and now I despise innovation also. Surely I must be a most wicked example for the world. She dies laughing. Gruad's rage is unbearable. He vows that he will wait no longer. Atlantis is too wicked to save, and he will destroy it. On a windswept plain in the northern regions of Atlantis, a huge teardrop-shaped rocket with graceful fins is poised on the launching pad. Gruad is in the control room, making last-minute adjustments while Kajetsi and Wo Tupad argue with him. His finger strikes a red button, and the rocket hurdles on its way to the sun. It will take several days to reach there, and meanwhile Grodd has gathered the unbroken circle on an airship, which takes them away from Atlantis, and into the huge mountains to the east, in a region that will one day be called Tibet. It is a beautiful day on Zukong Gimorlad Siragosa the sun shining down on its slender, graceful towers with spider-web bridges spiraling among them. Its parks, its temples, its museums, its fine public buildings and magnificent private palaces. Its handsome, richly furred people gracefully stride amidst the beauties of the first and the finest civilization man has ever produced. A quintet plays the melodious Zinthron, Balatet, Mordan, Swaz, and Fendrar. Suddenly, the sun's body rages. Coiled flames, balls of gas, roll out. The sun looks like a giant fiery arachnid or octopus. One great flame comes rolling toward the earth, burning red gas which turns yellow, then green, then blue, then white. There is nothing left of Zukongi Morlad Siragosa, except the pyramid with its upper segment now resting on the base the anti-gravity generators having been destroyed. The baleful eye looks out over an absolutely flat, burnt black plain. Thousands of cracks appear in the brittle surface of the continent, the strength of whose rocks have been destroyed by the incredible heat of the solar flare. A tide of mud starts crawling over the empty plain. It leaves only the top of the pyramid with the great eye showing. Water sweeps over the mud, at first sinking in and standing in pools, then rising higher so that only the tip of the pyramid sticks out of a great lake. Under the water enormous parallel fissures open in the ground on either side of the blackened central circle. 
the midsection of the continent, including the pyramid, begins to sink. The pyramid falls into the depths of the ocean with cliffs rising on either side of it to the parts of Atlantis that still remain above the ocean. They will remain for many thousands of years more, and they will be the Atlantis remembered in the legends of men. But the true Atlantis, high Atlantis, is gone. Gruad stares into his crimson glowing viewplate, watching the destruction of Atlantis. The light changes color from red to gray, and the face of Gruad turns gray. It is a terrible face. It has aged a hundred years in the last few minutes. But deep down he knows that what he has done isn't nice. And yet deep down there is satisfaction, too, for Gruad, long tortured by unreasonable guilt, now has something he can really feel guilty about. He turns to the unbroken circle and proposes. Since it appears that the earth will survive the cataclysm, he was not really sure that it would. The great beasts that inhabited Europe, Asia, and North America die off as a result of the mutations and diseases caused by the solar flare. All relics of the Atlantean civilization are destroyed. The people who were Gruad's erstwhile countrymen are either killed or driven forth to wander the earth. Besides Gruad's Himalayan colony, there is one other remnant of the High Atlantean Era, the Pyramid of the Eye, whose ceramic substance resisted solar flare, earthquake, tidal wave, and submersion in the depths of the ocean. Gruad explains that it is right that the Eye should remain. It is the Eye of God, the One the scientific, technical eye of ordered knowledge that looks down on the universe and by perceiving it, causes it to be. If an event is not witnessed, it does not happen. Therefore, for the universe to happen, there must be a witness. Among the primitive hunters and gatherers, a mutation has appeared that seems to be spreading rapidly. More and more people are being born without fur, and with hair in the same pattern as Gruad's. The hour of God's eye has caused mutations in every species. From the Himalayas, the rocket ships of the unbroken circle, painted red and white, swoop out in squadrons. They sweep across Europe and land on the brown islands where Atlantis used to be. There they land and raid a city of refugees from the Atlantean disaster. They kill many of the leaders and intellectuals and herd the rest aboard the ships, fly to the Americas and deposit the helpless people on a vast plain. Far below their route of passage lies the Pyramid of the Eye at the bottom of the Atlantic. The base of the pyramid is covered with silt, and the break where the upper part of the pyramid had floated on anti-gravity projectors is also covered. Still the pyramid itself towers over the mud around it. Taller by three times than the Great Pyramid of Egypt, the building of which lies twenty-seven thousand years in the future. A vast shadow descends upon the pyramid. There is a suggestion in the darkness of the ocean bottom of giant tentacles, of sucker disks wide as the rims of volcanoes, of an eye as big as the sun looking at the eye on the pyramid. Something touches the pyramid and enormous as it is, it moves slightly. Then the presence is gone. The pentagonal trap in which the people of Atlantis had heroically and brilliantly caught the dread ancient being Yog sothoth has been, amazingly, undamaged by the catastrophe. Being on the southern plain, which was relatively uninhabited, the pentagon of Yog sothoth becomes the center of a migration of people who survived the disaster, a second Atlantis begins to take root. And then, from the Himalayas, the ships of the unbroken circle come swooping down on one of their raids. Lines of Atlantean men and women are marched to the walls of the Pentagon and there mowed down by laser fire. Then explosive charges are placed amid the heaps of bodies and the masked, uniformed men of the unbroken circle withdraw. There is a series of explosions, Horrid yellow smoke goes coiling up. The gray stone walls crumble. There is a moment of stillness, balance, tension. Then the piled-up boulders of one side of the wall fly apart as if thrust by the hand of a giant. An enormous claw print 
appears in the soft soil around the ruins of the Pentagon. The masked men of the unbroken circle race frantically for their ships and take off. The ships dart into the sky, stop suddenly, waver and plummet like stones to explosive crashes on the earth. The surviving refugees scream and scatter. Like a scythe going through wheat, death sweeps among them in great arcs as they run in massed mobs. Mouths open, in soundless screams they fall. Only a handful escapes. Over the scene a colossal reddish figure of indeterminate shape and number of limbs stands triumphant. In the Himalayas, Gruad in the unbroken circle watch the destruction of the Pentagon and the massacre of the Atlanteans. The unbroken circle cheers, but Gruad strangely weeps. You think I hate walls, he says. I love walls. I love any kind of wall, anything that separates. Walls protect good people. Walls lock away the evil. There must always be walls and the love of walls. And in the destruction of the great Pentagon that held Yog sothoth I read the destruction of all that I stand for. Therefore, I am stricken with regret. At this the face of Evo, a young priest, takes on a reddish glow and a demoniac look. There is more than a hint of possession. It is good to hear you say that, he says to Gruad. No man yet has befriended me, though many have tried to use me. I have prepared a special place for your soul, O first of the men of the future. Gruad attempts to speak to Yag sothoth but the possession has apparently passed, and the other members of the unbroken circle praise a new beverage that Evo has prepared, made of the fermented juice of grapes. Gruad drinks. He puts down his glass, clutches his throat, and staggers back. His other hand goes to his heart. He topples over and lies on his back, his eyes staring upward. Naturally, everyone accuses Evo of poisoning Gruad, but Evo calmly answers that it was Lilith Velcor who did it. He was doing research on the energies of the dead and had learned how to take them into him but sometimes the energies of the dead could take control of him, so that he would be just a medium through which they act. He cries, When you write this tragedy into the archives, you must say, not that Evo the man did it, but Evo Lilith, possessed by the evil spirit of a woman. The woman did tempt me, I tell you. I was helpless. The unbroken circle is persuaded, and agree that since Lilith Velcor and the crazy goddess she worshipped were responsible for Guad's death, henceforward women must be subordinate to men so such evils will not be repeated. They decide to build a tomb for Guad and to inscribe upon it, The First Illuminated One. Never trust a woman. The End Lights flashed on suddenly. The screen rolled up into its receptacle with a snap. Blinded, Joe rubbed his eyes. He had a ferocious headache. He also had a ferocious need to urinate at once before his bladder exploded. He'd had an awful lot of drinks at the plastic martini party, then made love to that Chinese girl in the cab, then sat down to watch this movie without once taking time out to go to the bathroom. The pain in his groin was excruciating. He imagined it felt something like what Evo, that fellow in the movie, had experienced after he castrated himself. "'Where the hell is the John?' said Joe loudly. There was no one in the room. While he was absorbed in the movie, they, doubtless having seen it before, had crept away softly, leaving him alone to watch the death of Atlantis. "'Christ's sake!' he muttered. "'Gotta take a leak. If I don't find the bathroom right away, I'll pee in my pants.' Then he noticed a waste paper can under the table. It was walnut with a metal lining. He bent over and picked it up, sending new tremors of anguish through a body on the verge of bursting. He decided to use it as a receptacle, set it down again, unzipped his fly, took out his dick, and let go into the can. What if they all come trooping back into the room now, he thought. Well, he would be embarrassed, but what the hell? It was their fault for springing this movie on him without giving him a chance to make himself comfortable. Joe looked somberly down into the foam. Piss on Atlantis.